Uh, for those of you who stay in the room, we're continuing in our series, uh, focusing on unpacking the nativity. And I'd just be curious, how many of you have had a similar experience to me? Um, uh, when Sarah and I earlier this year had a chance to get a new minivan, we bought a Chrysler Pacifica. And this happens to me all the time. Every time I like start looking for or I'm interested in something new, I like see it everywhere. And so it seems like there are Chrysler Pacificas like on every street corner and every other driveway. And uh, the same was true for nativities, right? So Pastor Randy got us started in this series, Unpacking Your Nativity, and I started noticing all the ones around our house, and there's one in my office and coming and going and everywhere. And uh, maybe you had a similar experience where you just saw nativity sets Everywhere, although I do have to confess to Pastor Randy, I know you gave the advice to like not unpack them all. I failed, right? So I, uh, but I'm thinking about them, even though they're all already set up. So, uh, so here's what we're doing: is we are just kind of walking through the Christmas story as we journey through Advent, and we're taking a look at each of the characters, the role that play, the part that they have in the nativity and the Christmas story, and then also what God is speaking and teaching us through each of them. Last weekend, it was Mary. Uh, that, that makes sense. It's a good place to start. And this weekend, as you may have gathered, it's Joseph. Okay, And so to take a look at the role of Joseph, we're going to walk kind of slowly through the gospel reading for today, starting with Matthew chapter 1. And here's how Matthew begins to tell the story of the birth of Jesus uh, and, and the role that Mary and Joseph play. Here's what he says. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When, Mary, his, when, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now for perhaps the most important moment in human history, at least up to that point, um, uh, Matthew chooses to describe all of it with some very few and very important words. Um, and I'd like to draw to your attention to a number of them this morning. He says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. It's like his introduction to this moment, his invitation to reflect and consider what God has been doing. Now, in most of our English translations of this verse, uh, the word a birth is, is the word that will show up, but it's translated from an interesting word in Greek, which you probably know, and that word is Genesis. Right? Now, the genesis of Jesus the Christ took place in this way is the way Matthew begins. Genesis, of course, is also the name of the first book of the Bible, and it means simply the origins or the beginning. And so it's like Matthew is signaling after he's given us the genealogy of Jesus, now this is how the story goes and this is where it begins. But he also neatly, with the choice of that word, connects what's going to happen here to the very beginning of everything where God sought to enter into our human experience, first through the creation of Adam and Eve, and now through the birth of his own son, a second Adam, as Paul describes him, who would seek to enter into our now broken humanity to bring to completion God's promise and plan of rescue and redemption. All of that in a simple link back to the first book of the Bible, the Genesis of Jesus. So here's how it happened, Matthew says. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now you may have heard this before. Mary and Joseph, uh, as those who were betrothed to be married, uh, they were in a legally bound relationship. What had likely happened was that Joseph... Uh, after having uh, prepared the resources required to finally make the commitment to take a wife and begin a family and then be able to support them, had, had gone to her parents, had asked for her hand in marriage, and had almost certainly given some form of bride price or dowry to demonstrate to them that he was ready to take care of her and then also to replace the economic value of having lost her as part of the family. That's just the way the culture worked back then. But what we also know would have happened is then he would have taken some time before they would actually have uh, completed their marriage process and before they were uh, brought together as husband and wife. And during that time, 
he would have likely gone back to work, he would have saved up even more, and, and almost certainly would have gone to his father and said, I'd like to build a room onto our house and, and, and have this room the place be where I would start my family and bring my wife. And, and he would have gone to prepare a place for his wife, and then when he was ready, he would, have go, he would have come back to take her to be with him, and they would then celebrated the marriage. And maybe even that language I just used reminds you of where it shows up in John chapter 14, where Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when I come back, I'll take you to be with me. Right? Jesus there echoing the language of marriage because he is the bridegroom and we, his church, are the bride. So a similar thing likely had been playing out in the life of Mary and Joseph. They'd been legally bound and committed. It was as if they were already husband and wife, but they were not living together and they were not acting in the normal way that a husband and wife would after having been married because the celebration and the culmination was still to come. And so it was in that in-between time, however long it was, it may have been several months, it may have been a a year or more, that it was discovered uh, that Mary was pregnant before they had culminated their marriage process, but that it was from the Holy Spirit. Now what happens next? Her husband, Joseph, he's the center of our tension today, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Honestly, we don't actually know all that much about Joseph, aside from uh, this first chapter or two in Matthew and a few other references. We know, for example, that he was a a laborer uh, who specialized in uh, construction, He was a carpenter, is how it's often translated, which means he was handy with wood and probably with stone. And uh, if we were to put together some of the pieces, he probably was involved in some of the major infrastructure uh, developments in and around the Galilee for his hometown, it seems, was Nazareth, or at least that's where he was from and that's where he returned. Um, And that's where Jesus was raised. Um, We know that he seems to have passed away sometime before Jesus was an adult because the last time he shows up in the Bible is when Jesus is 12 years old and they're at the temple for their annual celebration of Passover. And if you remember that story, it's in Luke's gospel, Uh, Jesus gets left behind but they find him in the temple and he says, well, where would you expect me to be? I'm in my father's house. And we get a first indication that Jesus uh, knew of his divine nature as the Son of God. But Joseph, we're told here, was a just, or it's sometimes uh, translated, a righteous man. He was a man who, uh, to the best of his ability, would seek to do the right thing regardless of the circumstances. And so in this case, having somehow or another heard the shocking, tragic, and uh, certainly, at least at first glance, bad news that his young wife-to-be was already pregnant. He, he tried to do what in his mind was the right thing, to quietly dissolve the relationship through the appropriate legal channels because it was a legally constituted uh, betrothal, uh, to perhaps let her go back home to her family and try to figure life out there. Maybe he would even have a chance to demand back his bride price. He could have done all of these things, and that was his intent. Um, it's interesting, uh, two days ago, uh, Friday night, Sarah and I had a chance to go with our kids to see uh, the Chosen Christmas Special at the AMC Randhurst Theater in Mount Prospect. Some of you maybe have heard about this, maybe not. Some of you have heard about The Chosen. We've talked about it before. It's a great video-based retelling of the story of Jesus, primarily focused on his earthly ministry, but they just came out with a Christmas special. It's got a lot of great modern worship music, about an hour's worth, actually. So just being honest, Drew was almost asleep in my lap by the time we got to 8 o'clock, and the story started playing. So if you've got youngers, uh, they may not be as interested in that first part, but um, he perked right up when they, they did the video retelling of Mary and Joseph making their journey to Bethlehem. And along the way, uh, what what stuck out to me was a conversation Mary and Joseph had. And again, the the chosen tries to tell maybe the story around the story, but in a faithful way to what's in Scripture. And what I remember is as they were journeying down the road, uh, they had Mary say to Joseph, thank you. Um, Thank you uh, for protecting me and taking care of me, um, and looking out for me. 
Again, not in the Bible, but perhaps a conversation they may have had on the way to Bethlehem. The point being, she would have known well that it was entirely within his rights to not only divorce her, send her away quietly, but, but in fact, in, in an effort to protect his reputation, he could have publicly accused her, and it could have led ultimately even to her death. For capital punishment was uh, the prescribed uh, consequence of this kind of unfaithfulness. And so what we can learn about Joseph in this moment is that as a just and righteous man, it was his intent to do the right thing and to do so humbly, even when it would have hurt him. But ultimately, it was not what God had in mind for him. Let's keep going with the story. Verse 20, uh, he says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And this is what the angel said. This is our memory verse. We just read this out loud a moment ago. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So here Joseph Uh, perhaps having heard some of the worst news of his life about the potential uh, unfaithfulness of his wife, uh, gets a confirmation message directly from God through this angel. And it's packed full with with powerful promise and hope. And and it's what exactly Joseph needed to hear. Uh, Joseph, descended from David himself, part of the royal family. Don't be afraid. Because what's happening here is not what you would naturally have concluded, but it's something supernatural. It's something only God could have done. The child within your bride to be is the very child of God, the long-awaited Savior, Jesus, who will save us from his sins. Right? Joseph, as the son of David, probably was well familiar with all the promises that God had given. Here's an example of just a few and how Jesus' name kind of connects to all of them. This is from Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2 in part. It says, comfort, comfort my people. Why? Because Israel, God's people, her her iniquity is pardoned. And then later on, from the fourth servant song, you may know this from the season of Lent, Isaiah 53 says, the Lord has laid on him the one who would suffer, the iniquity of us all. And in Jeremiah 31, another example in verse 34, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Right, the angel came to Joseph to tell him that the thing that he naturally would have concluded was in fact not what was happening, but supernaturally God was now entering into humanity to bring to completion all of these promises and all of what he had been working from the very beginning. His desire to seek to redeem and restore all creation, all humanity, through the death, the resurrection of his son, Jesus. But it had to begin humbly, uh, hidden, in a sense, in Mary and in Joseph, in a manger, in a stable, in the nativity, as we are celebrating this season. Joseph, um, we're told, uh, after hearing this, he, he could have remembered this passage itself. This is what Matthew puts together for us, how that prophetic word from the angel fulfills the prophetic word from the prophet Isaiah. This is in chapter 7, verse 14. Matthew says, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by that prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means, you probably know, God with us, right? So whether or not uh, Joseph recognized it in the moment or only later on, Matthew tells us, see, this is how all of this is fitting together. What, What Joseph probably assumed was happening wasn't what was actually happening, but indeed, God was using this moment, this man and this woman, to bring into the world his very own son the one who would bring God into humanity and would begin the work of redeeming and restoring all things, of returning to what God's dream and plan was from the beginning, 
For if you remember back in Genesis, God's intent was to dwell closely with his people. Adam and Eve, who had walked with in the cool of the day, he longs to be with us. He desires to be close with us. And in Jesus, he comes as close as Godhead can get. He becomes one of us so that he might dwell with us for forever. Joseph was a man who humbly sought to do the right thing, even at times when it would hurt. But he was also someone who would listen carefully to whatever God would say, whether through an angelic messenger. And this was the first of several times where angels would come and and give directions to Joseph. And I think there's a good chance he was also familiar with God's word of promise, like that one from Isaiah chapter 7 and the others I showed you a moment before. Faith like Joseph listens carefully to what God says. And then faith like Joseph does something. Verses 24 and 25. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until he had give, she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Joseph with simple faith in the message from the angel and in the promise of God, uh, does what he is called to do. He takes Mary as his wife. He protects her, provides for her, uh, and treats this son as if he was his own. And, and I love, again, going back to The Chosen. If you haven't had a chance to go see it, I encourage you to do it. It probably will drop online uh, through the streaming app at some point in time. But there's a very memorable moment in the way they choose to portray the birth of Mary. They they get to the stable area where she's to give birth, and Mary's preoccupied with making a bed for baby Jesus, and there's a manger there, and that's pretty cool, and Joseph's trying to build her a bed, you know, and uh, she says, I don't have time for that, and so all he has time to do is shovel some stuff off the floor. You can fill in the gaps with what might be on the floor in a stable to make room for where Jesus would be born, but humbly hidden in this small family uh, with Joseph and Mary, God is now set to enter into humanity in Jesus, to begin the work of redemption and restoration that long had been promised. And what's Joseph's role in this? He responds immediately and obediently. He doesn't ask questions, doesn't ask for more information. He just does what God calls him to do, and even when it may not all have made sense. Last night after uh, worship, a friend came up to me and said, hey, Micah, um, I love this. I love all this. I'm wondering, um, how would Joseph have known who the Holy Spirit was? (laughs) I said, good question. I've never actually thought about that, right? Because here's the angel coming to Joseph and saying, that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. But, but, But in the Old Testament, there are hints and there are suggestions of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it's not fully revealed until we have Christ. And so, um, when the angel comes and says it's of the Holy Spirit, how would Joseph know what that meant? Short answer is, I don't know. I've got to think about that a little bit more. But he had the faith to be able to respond, take the angel at his word and say, okay, if God is saying it, I'm going to do it. And the posture of Joseph, the example he sets for us, is one of faithful obedience to God's word as well. So here's what I'd like you to do. These are going to be our here and practice questions. I'd like you to think about these uh, if you're on your own or if you're with someone, maybe reflect on them with them. I asked you earlier, what's some bad news you've heard? I want you to think about that again, maybe the same example or another example. And then how did you respond, especially in the moment? And then as the second question, now that you've thought a little bit more, heard a little bit more about Joseph and what faith like Joseph looks like, how could you respond differently um, with faith like Joseph in the future? Take a few moments, think about that, reflect on that if you're on your own, share it with someone else, and then we'll continue with our worship here in just a few minutes.